Okay, welcome to Rock Docs, a podcast about music documentaries. I'm David Lizabram, here with my co-host... Andrew Keats. And we are also here with uh, Stephen Hyden, who is uh, a uh, music writer who we love. Uh, he writes a bunch of books, which we also love. The latest book is Long Road, Pearl Jam, and the Soundtrack of a Generation. Uh, Steve, say hi. Hello. Thanks for having me. <laughs> uh, Ple- pleasure our- is all ours. Our Pleasure is entirely that, on this side of the table. <laughs> our fans know we're a big fan of you. We often, uh, you know, shout you out on the podcast. We are fans of uh, your IndieCast um, show, um, as well as um, the uh, 36 from the Vault series you did uh, with our friend of the podcast, Rob Mitchum, about the dead. Um, so um, you've got a lot to say about a lot of things, but uh, I think today we're mostly going to talk about um, Pearl Jam, uh, the movie Pearl Jam 20. Uh, directed by Cameron Crowe from uh, 2011, I think, and uh, and the book. Um, but before we get into that, I'm um, Andy. I'm calling an audible. Okay. Uh, Andy's not prepared for this, but um, Steve, um, we might need a little bit of a therapy session here. But I was thinking, <laughs> okay. Andy and I have a problem that perhaps the best and maybe the only person in the world who can solve it is Steve Hyden. Wow. So <laughs> okay, I'm glad um, I'm here. Okay. Andy and I both have a favorite band. We each have a favorite band. And neither of us has really been able to get the other one fully on board with that band. Um, uh, Andy's favorite band is Fish, which I'm not particularly a fan of. Uh, okay. And my favorite band is Guided by Voices, um, which I don't think Andy hates, but, you know, just never really went deep. Is that yeah. fair to say, Andy? That's exactly right. All right. So, Steve, you are on record as being a fan of both of these bands. Yes. Um, can you draw a connection here? Is there a reason why a Fish fan should, you know, really give a good listen to Guided by Voices or vice versa? Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at it in terms of world building, you know, that I think a big part of the appeal of Fish is that you have hundreds of shows spread out over many decades. And it's really fun to dig into the minutia of particular tours, particular eras, the mythology of particular shows, the mythology of particular songs and albums and it really is like a universe unto itself uh so if you're looking for an immersive experience fish really gives that to you gotta buy voices also gives that to you because it's not necessarily about shows although they're a great live band but there's so many albums and so many songs and robert pollard is such a creative person and you know pollard like the songwriting partnership of Trey Anastasio and Tom Marshall, they also like fanciful concepts in their songs and they like fanciful titles. And I think they both come from being influenced by seventies arena rock, seventies prog rock. You know, uh, one of Robert Pollard's favorite bands is Genesis. One of Trey Anastasio's favorite bands is Genesis. And you can hear the influence of Genesis on both bands i mean maybe that is the place where you two can meet in the middle you should be listening to uh you know uh selling england by the pound uh the land lies down down on on broadway Broadway. yeah you know the peter gabriel era stuff although i mean personally i love genesis i love the whole career but the gabriel era stuff in particular maybe you guys should bond over that and then draw the connections between both bands yeah and then maybe you'll have a mutual appreciation society at that point yeah, David, we just let this dispute lie, and we just spend a lot of time talking to each other about Genesis, and then it's, it's, it solves itself from there. If you're both Genesis fans, <laughs> yeah. you will both come to like both Fish and Guided by Voices, I think. Fascinating. Uh, I'm that, willing to... That's, that's the missing link between those two bands, really. All right. I, I enjoy the Peter Gabriel era Genesis. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm a hard, hardcore head, but I'm willing to give it, I'm willing to give it a shot. Andy? I got... I got really down with uh, Lambs Lie Down on Broadway because when Trey talked about that always being the the album he wanted to do for the Halloween sets. And, yeah. um, and actually getting Peter Gabriel to, to sing come it, up, which, would, yes. which yes. would have been amazing. And yeah. you listen to Pollard, I think Gabriel is clearly one of his vocal influences, mm-hmm. you know, particularly mm-hmm. Gabriel at that time. Um, you listen to Alone, Stinking, and Unafraid. One of the great Guided by <laughs> yep. Voices songs. Sure. I think there's like there's actually a live clip of them playing that in 2001. And I think Robert Pollard says, I feel like Peter Gabriel when I sing this song. 
Um, so yeah, I, I, I do think that there's definitely connections between both of those bands as someone who loves GBV and fish, mm-hmm. you know, GBV is the grateful dead of beer as has yeah. been said. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. I, I mean, also we, think there's like, yeah. there's like, there's something about like, like GBV playing like a, a, a show of like 52 songs or whatever they do is like, it's not exactly the same. It's different in a lot of ways, but it's also like a cousin of fish playing a set of like five songs with a, with a 32 minute jam in there, you know, like it's, they're opposite ends of the, the, the spectrum, but there's like a horseshoe theory where they're very similar. Well, and with some fish songs, you know, like, a, like fluff head or you enjoy right. myself. It is like kind of like five songs in one song. Yes. You know, exactly. it is like a suite. Yeah. So, in, <laughs> or unfortunately so, drift while you're sleeping. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. uh, I saw, I went to see them. Actually, I went with Rob to see them at Alpine Valley yeah. uh, on this last tour and, such mediocre shows i have to say i was kind of disappointed <laughs> yeah. i mean there were some good shows on that tour I, the alpine stand was not that good yeah. and i was i was kind of like am i gonna be the guy who prefers to listen to goose now i'm uh, kind of in that zone right now i think buddy, you're talking I, to two of them right here <laughs> but buddy i went to a lot of mediocre fish shows this summer we gotta say and uh, I went to one goose show, and I was buzzing off of it compared to the to get, compared to my my fish summer. Yeah, that goose it, show was great. Yeah, yeah, they're well, they're a different point in their career, obviously. But yeah, man, yeah. they're. I was I, w- I went to the the L A show where they brought Lucius out for. Oh, Saturday. you were oh wow okay that's and, awesome uh, man I I I really am hopeful that they do something in the studio with Lucius because that that works that is a that is a. a fruitful pairing and i gotta say that record drip field very good good record record. yeah very uh, you know uh, as someone who liked goose i didn't have super high expectations for like you know like a jam band studio record yeah but i think that they make good records i'm i'm really curious to see what he does i think they can make records where they sound like an indie band they do yeah and then and then extrapolate them live but like they're they don't sound like a jam band making a studio record like on there. They sound like a band that just made a good record and then they go play live and it, it's something different. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. That's that's my selling point on them as well. All right. So to uh, to flow these things together, actually, yesterday <laughs> I was watching a I was watching a video of, on YouTube of uh, Robert Pollard um, performing uh, Bob O'Reilly with Pearl Jam in 2004, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I think it was I don't know if. Oh, sick. Okay. Yeah. It was the, yeah. um, yeah, right after, uh, the, the end of the, the original end of Guided by Voices. And, um, it's awesome. I want to live in that video for the rest of my life. Um, right. <laughs> and which is another the- thing to love about Eddie Vedder for me is that he got Robert Pollard into an arena to sing Bob O'Reilly, which is not something he would have ever been able to do, yeah. you know? But like, cause how many times I've seen him sing that in a club? And thinking I was in Wembley Stadium or something, yeah. and then because yeah, because he, uh, he Robert Pollard's solo band opened for Pearl Jam at their Dayton, Ohio day, uh, show in '06, and uh, and then so, and I think there's a live album recorded of that actually that Robert Pollard put out. But yeah, I don't know how many times Robert Pollard's been in an arena, but you know <laughs> Eddie Vedder got game. him in there. Yeah, Eddie Vedder yeah. got him in there. So oh, yeah. you know. So if you're a Pearl Jam agnostic, as a Guided by Voices fan, you got to at least say, hey, man, you, you know, they got him into an arena to sing Bob O'Reilly. That's pretty amazing. Well, I'm not a Pearl Jam agnostic. I, I think you and I are approximately the same age. I was born in 76. Um, are you, you were like right around then? Um, 77. OK, so we're yeah roughly the same age. Uh, and yeah. Pearl Jam, you know, was such a big deal when you and I were, mm-hmm. you know, in high school. Um, and. Pearl Jam, yeah, it's a little weird to me because I um I grew up in North County, San Diego, and Eddie Vedder grew up across the street from like a guy I knew. Um, and I didn't know him, but it was like when Pearl Jam came out, it was like, yeah, you see that guy on MTV, like he was, you know, the stoner who worked at the gas station that I probably bought three <laughs> musketeers from, and like he lived across the street from Andy Marks's house. And, you know, um, so it was a little bit uh I, I think it based on the book, Pearl Jam hit you as like these 
you know, gods from outer space <laughs> or something. Whereas for me, it was a little bit more, it seemed a little more down to earth because it was like a guy I could have seen around the neighborhood. And I, I don't know. It, so it, from that perspective, it was a little different. But um, yeah, I mean, well, I mean the, I, the rush I, of I, when I, they arrived was just huge. I think it was down to earth for me too. I mean, you know, the thing with Pearl Jam, and this is like an overstated thing about the era, but it, it is true that um, I was used to seeing people on MTV that were wearing spandex and were surrounded by beautiful women all the time. And it was as a kid who was nerdy and awkward, it was alienating to see that. I mean, now I appreciate that hair metal stuff, but when I was a kid and I felt like I'm going to be a virgin my entire life, you know, <laughs> no, no girl's ever going to want to talk to me to see Brett Michaels sing unskinny bop. You know, I could not relate to that at all. And it actually made me feel bad about myself because I'm like, I'm not a blonde dude in a band. I'm like this nerd from middle America who has a mullet. And, you know, I'm always I'm never going to be cool. So there was something I think about those alternative bands that came in where it was. I mean, Eddie Vedder is a great looking guy. Kurt Cobain is a great looking guy. These are all like Chris Cornell was like a gorgeous guy, but there was something about them where they're singing about hating themselves. And I'm like, yeah. that I can relate to. Like, <laughs> I hate myself too. <laughs> and this makes me feel better about myself. And also the, just the idea of someone critiquing mainstream culture, which of course now we're just immersed in people are always shitting on everything. But back then it was unusual to hear people talk about, um, you know, mainstream TV or mainstream music or mainstream whatever being garbage. You know, yeah. like th you didn't really hear that expressed all that much. There was this facade of, gen of you know, gent of people being genteel and polite all the time. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so to have people come about and, and say, no, like mainstream culture is bullshit. Uh, that was very exhilarating, and to do, it. And to you know, do it in on mainstream channels, right? Exactly, and, and for people like me who didn't have access to, I didn't really know about underground culture. I didn't know about indie rock. I didn't really know about anything that wasn't on t television. You know, just because mm -hmm. I, I lived in a small town and there wasn't, you didn't have exposure to those things, and uh, you know, there was alternative rock and then i remember when uh tarantino came out with reservoir dogs like yeah. those are very close in my mind because tarantino had a similar thing where that opened up film history because he would do interviews talking about directors who i'd never heard of and all of a sudden this culture that i didn't know about was just exposed to me yeah. um and i think to a lot of people and that's why it was so significant you know like because a lot of us didn't know who the Pixies were. We didn't really know who Sonic Youth was right away. We didn't know uh, the Butthole Surfers or Meat Puppets or whoever the case may be. And it was, the, the, so they were really a gateway for a lot of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, so we can, this, we can transition here into sort of the, the premise of your book. Because your, your, your book is a, a history and it's uh, exhaustive. And it, I think, it, you know, it's for, it has a lot for Pearl Jam fans, but also people who, were around in the nineties, but maybe don't, uh, didn't go deep or didn't stick with them. Um, but it, it, it does make a, a pretty specific argument about what Pearl Jam was. And, um, so I'll set that up by saying that I have a, a bit of an interesting or a different perspective than you guys. I'm about seven years younger than you guys. Um, and my brother is about seven years older than me. And so like, I was like 10, 11, like exactly the age when you start like toying with the idea of having interests when Pearl Jam was breaking. Um, the, the, the first time I bought an album, I bought 10 and the chronic at the same time. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Real good and choices. Yeah. You know, my, yeah, my first, up. my, my first, I mean, I, I bought cassettes before this, but my first two CDs mm -hmm. were the single soundtrack and check your head. Okay. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> very similar, similar thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it was, yeah. If you were a kid, you were listening to, alternative rock and also gangster rap or yeah or hip-hop i mean it was it was not like separate at all right right and so and so like pearl jam to me like that was, my brother was very into pearl jam 
the like the the teenagers who I was looking up to aspirationally were into Pearl Jam. And so I like even though I was much younger, I read this whole book with like pinpoint memory of a lot of it. Like I I was seeing the world as like the the what I wanted to be when I got to high school through the eyes of Pearl Jam and I like experienced the culture through them in a lot of ways. Um so even though I was quite a bit younger, the book um really resonates with me because you know i i wasn't like out there going to grunge shows but i was but but i like i really wanted that 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 idea seemed very cool to me as a as an 11 year old um so i I say that to tee you up what like what you know pearl jam in the soundtrack of a generation what's what's the case you're making here about who pearl jam was in the 90s well i think you know one of the ideas of the book is to talk about pearl jam like through the lens of generation x and like one of the arguments of the book is that like they're like the quintessential generation x band because generation x i think is a rare generation in that it's a very self-critical uh generation and i like i tend to think that if you look at boomers and like millennials and zoomers you know like when they talk about like their cultural favorites it's always like our stuff is the best you know yeah. certainly with boomers that's the case Whereas with Gen Xers, I think that there was like a self-negating tendency in that in that time to uh, to kill your heroes, you know, like that, you know, and to question your heroes. Um, and I think that has happened with Pearl Jam over the years. They, I think, they have like an interesting standing now, like where um, there's a lot of people that love them, but I feel like there's like there's also like a lot of people my age that look at that as like, well, that's something I liked when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. And it seems very tied to the time. And I think I was trying to make a case for their career in the nineties, but also outside the nineties and to look at like how they've changed over time and, and how they became this band that was really unique for their generation in that they survived, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. so many of the great big superstar nineties rock bands, fell apart you know and certainly if you're just looking at the seattle like big four pearl jam nirvana soundgarden alice in chains the lead singers out of three of those bands are dead you know and pearl jam is the one that is carried on and in a way you you could argue that they were under the most strain out of those four Mm -hmm. you know if particularly if you look at like the mid nineties when they were extremely popular, but they were fighting with Ticketmaster. There was a backlash brewing against them. Uh, there was a lot of internal strife. And as someone who's just interested in bands, I just thought like, wow, this is like a really interesting band to think about, you know, just their career arc and like how they were so successful early on. And I feel like people forget like how successful they were. Yeah. Like they were doing Taylor Swift numbers in the early nineties, which seems like incredible for a rock band. I don't think that will ever be replicated. Certainly not a band that's like Pearl Jam. There might be a rock band that's like Imagine Dragons or something that can sell a lot of records, but like not like a flannel wearing sort of classic sounding rock band yeah. that was at the center of the culture. So yeah, just looking at like how they survived and thinking about that, I just thought that was really interesting uh to do. I was like, I want to spend a year writing about that and trying to figure out like why they made it. Yeah. I think that ties into the movie as well. So um, since we are nominally about music documentaries, (laughs) um, I do want to kind of dig in a little bit to the movie. So Pearl Jam 20 came out about 10 years ago, um, uh, directed by Cameron Crowe, um, which we always really like to kind of see, especially when I, you know, famous director who's not really known for documentaries primarily um dips into the rock doc genre um we always love that i mean martin scorsese peter jackson ron howard um you know they've all kind of todd haynes they've all had their um turn at bat um i'm just gonna not i'm gonna kind of you know blow the lead here and say like i think that this is in the top two or three cameron crowe movies um Mm. in his you know Andy and I were kind of discussing this the other day. Like I, you know, I, I mean, I think for me personally, like it's hard to beat almost famous um, because of the topic and, you know, how significant it was um, culturally. And I, I just have a lot of love and affection for that movie. 
Um, I remember Roger Ebert's review of Almost Famous was something like this movie is like getting a warm hug. You know, it just has that feeling. Um, but, um, you know, and I love Say Anything. I love singles. Um, you know, in terms of the movies he's directed, the rest of them have, you know, maybe some of them have their, their problems or whatever. Um, but um, this is up there for me um, in terms of, uh, you know, if somebody was saying, hey, I want to get into Cameron Crowe and see what he's done. Obviously, people don't necessarily think of this one when they're discussing his filmography. But to me, it's as strong as um, as basically anything he's done. Well, similarly, I'll say, uh, you know, so that's placing this within Cameron Crowe's filmography. I, I would say among the rock doc canon, like this movie with like right next to History of the Eagles and Running Down a Dream are like the comfort food fair that I, I could watch a million times and have watched a, like a million times. <laughs> like the, the the music is great. The The filmmaking, like compared to some of the movies we've been watching lately, which we've liked. Like the quality of filmmaking here is so, so much better than your like standard issue rock doc. And like that does elevate it quite a bit. And uh, I don't know. I, I, I think it's a fantastic movie. Yeah, I'm a fan of it for sure. You know, you mentioned History of the Eagles and uh, what was the other one you mentioned? Run Down Run a Dream and Petty Doc. And those are both two part. Oh, yeah. you know, like three and a half, four hours. And if I had a complaint about Pearl Jam Twenty, I wish it was like a at least like a half hour longer. Yeah. And if, if anything, just like let some of the music stretch out a little bit. Um, yeah, it's great. I mean, you know, with all of these movies, there's always the question of sort of authorization and like how much leeway does the author of the film have in giving like an unvarnished view and typically with documentaries there there's not uh you know much you know there's there's a lot of varnish in a lot of these movies <laughs> yeah. and that's like one of the great things really about that eagles documentary which i think separates it yeah it just because those guys are so petty that you couldn't <laughs> hide that anyway um mr so <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Well, and just like Glenn Fry at the top, like being in the Eagles was a fucking blast. And he just looks, he, he just looks like the mean dad at a baseball game, you know, yeah. like the, like the hard ass dad who's yelling at his kids on the field. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, the thing that you get in exchange for these films being authorized is just the access and because Cameron Crowe knew those guys from the beginning of their career, he just has like amazing footage. Yes. You know, particularly of them early on, like where you see Jeff and stone outside of like a cult concert in yes. 1990, you know, just, just crazy amount of stuff that like you wouldn't have gotten if this was just like an independent thing. I mean, like just to bring it back to my book for a second, you know, like I, you know, this isn't a biography. I'm a, I'm a music critic. So I wrote a book from a critic's perspective. And, you know, sometimes people say like, well, you're not interviewing anyone in the band for this. Well, I'm like, well, it's not that kind of book. If you want that book, you should read the Pearl Jam 20 book that came along with the film. And for me, it's like part of what's good about maybe my approach, not that it should be the only approach. I think it's a good complimentary thing to like the official Pearl Jam book. But like, I can say that this album wasn't very good, or yeah, I can yeah. say that they screwed up here, or I can include the thing. I could talk about the things that maybe don't end up in the movie. You know, like one thing about Pearl Jam 20 that I think is interesting, and I've written about this in the past, is like how they present Eddie's relationship with Kurt Cobain yeah, and that how that whole thing played out, because... The fact of the matter is, is that Kurt Cobain shit on Eddie Vedder a lot, you know, and even like in one of his last interviews that he did with Rolling Stone that David Frick did. Even after, because he talks in there about like, I just met Eddie Vedder at the MTV Video Music Awards. He's a good guy. I don't think Sweet he's a terrible guy. Yeah, yeah. You know, he says something like, I don't think he's trying to be the worst in the world. You know, he gets him yeah. like a very backhanded yeah, compliment yeah, yeah. and then and then he says something like i had so many better quotes than this in my head uh you know it's like <laughs> he, he can't he can't help shitting on better even at the end of his life yeah and in the movie they kind of gloss over that kind of stuff um but you well, know again i think you trade that 
for just the incredible access and footage that you get yeah. in that movie. And again, like there's so much good footage that I'm like, you could let this roll a little bit longer. Like this movie could have been three hours, I think. And, or I'd like to see a three hour cut of it, you know, like where there's just more footage of stuff and old concerts and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, so, so to your first point about, um, um, it, it, you know, comparing it to the, these multi-part uh, movies like history of the Eagles, um, you know, I had an idea in my head about this movie that your book changed my opinion on, um, which is w- the first 55 times that I saw this movie. Um, I thought of the end where they talk about how changing up the set list and becoming this live act where, where it wasn't about albums. It was about the tour became the focus of the band. I almost thought of that as like the uh, live writing of get over it in history of the Eagles part two (laughs) as like this, like unconvincing case to be made about like the latter half of their career being as good as the, the first half of their career or something like that. Yeah. And your book persuaded me that that is actually right though, that, that, that the transition to them being a, uh, uh, you know, Springsteen S band where the fan community obsesses over the decisions and the versions and the tour. Uh, I think that's true now. And I, but the movie left on its own didn't convince me of that. Your book, your book convinced me of that. And I, I realized yeah. that watching the movie the second time I said, Oh, you know, now all of a sudden I'm all along for the ride on this argument where I used to almost snicker at it. Um, yeah. It, it, almost like if the movie had been a little bit longer, they could have included more live stuff. From yeah. like later in their career. Cause I do think that especially when that movie was made, that you know, it came out in 2011. So looking at their touring in the 2010s, that's like some of their best tours ever, really. Yeah. You know, if you listen to the bootlegs from that that era, there's like just some just fantastic shows. Cause you know, because the thing with that movie is that I think they don't get out of the nineties until like an hour and a half into it. Yeah. You know. Yeah like the like the first decade is an hour and a half and like the last decade is about 30 minutes yeah um so which makes sense i mean look they are a band they put out seven records i think in their first 11 years and they put out four since then you know in the last 20 years uh so there's no question that there's been a creative slowdown as far as them as a unit but yeah, I mean, I, but at the same time, like you're saying, like the the fan community that's built around them as a live act, I think, has been really special and has really sustained them uh, over the long haul. Yeah. So there, there's one decision right at the top of this movie, and we could maybe start going through it a little bit chronologically here. But um, this movie basically starts its narrative. I mean, there's there's a little preamble with. Cameron Crowe saying, hi, I'm Cameron Crowe. I'm a rock writer. You might know me from such films as Almost Famous and Singles. Um, and then he, you know, he he talks about the Seattle sound and what they were. And then the the movie starts like very quickly from there with Mother Love Bone. And um, I think the movie started, if the movie had started with Green River, that might have created space to um, more honestly deal with some of the Kurt Cobain stuff you mentioned and, and the, you know, the, the extent to which Kurt Cobain was not alone in some of those feelings. Um, and like green river being this sort of, um, like quintessential proto grunge band before people knew what those words were. Um, and the split between mother love bone and eventually Pearl jam and mud honey sort of defining like two different ways of the, 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 the Seattle thing could have gone. I mean, basically Kurt was on the mud honey side of that, that split. And there are other people who were as well. And I, I, maybe it wouldn't have been a good decision. Maybe it would have been a worse movie, but it is a decision to sort of gloss over that stone and Jeff's previous band w- was quite significant before getting into the Andy Wood story as this movie does. Yeah, I mean, I think again, if if it were a longer movie, yeah, you yeah. could do that. I think it is worth exploring. You could start the movie with Jeff Amet moving to Seattle from yeah. Montana. You know yeah. that yeah. he's like this kid from a rural area who, uh, you know, 
he, he's into punk and he wants to uh, and like Seattle's like the big city for him and, and he gets in pretty much like at the ground floor of like Seattle punk if not the ground floor then like the second floor from the ground I mean very early on <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah it is funny with Pearl Jam because and I've had this conversation with people who are like I can't believe Mud Honey toured with Pearl Jam. Like, why would Mud Honey <laughs> tour with Pearl Jam? And I'm like, because the guys that were in Mud Honey were the same band as you know as Pearl Jam. Like, people don't know that, right? You know, right. they don't understand the shared history. And I think if people knew that, it would it, it makes the some of the critiques that came from say Kurt Cobain seem ridiculous. And and this is something I write about in the book. You know, there's like all this focus on like Kurt Cobain and Eddie Vedder. But like, really, I think it's about Kurt Cobain and Jeff Amon. Yeah. You know, like, like, because Kurt, because Kurt would insult him specifically as like a jock and yeah. as a careerist, and and Jeff is like, you know, like the money that I made from my band helped pay for your record. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. like I yeah, could yeah. point that out if I right. wanted to be a jerk about it. Right. I mean, and that's another interesting thing, you know, about the film. If you compare it to the book, I don't yeah. know if you guys have read the book that accompanies the movie the Pearl Jam 20 book. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Um, the book is, uh, the book is great. And it actually, in that part of the book, you, you have Jeff and uh, Mike McCready talking about C- 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 Cobain in like a much more critical way. Hmm, I think certainly Jeff had a, like, a, I think Jeff was pissed off by yeah. a lot of that stuff. And, and rightfully so, you know, because, you know, maybe Eddie had some uh, survivor some, like, sk- some and like imposter complex, like imposter he, he, complex. Yeah, yeah, like maybe I don't yeah. feel like I paid my dues, even though he'd been around for a while. It's not like he sure. was just like an overnight sensation, but like Jeff and Stone did not. Yes, you know they, you know they'd been in this band that was about to make it. The lead singer dies. You know they'd been in Green River and that fell apart. And like I'm, I'm with them. Like I, I totally get. Like, like just perspective of like I, I don't want to wash dishes my whole life like i did that for like a long time yeah like i'm not gonna apologize for that um but yeah that would have that would have been a different film for sure it's interesting thinking about this movie because it was made 20 years into their career right you know and now we're 30 years into their career in a way i wonder if they made this film too early yeah yeah that's you know yeah because Although maybe the last 10 years wouldn't have been as interesting. Yeah. And it certainly, about. and it certainly didn't feel that way at the time to me. Like it seemed no. like totally in 2011, it felt totally appropriate to have like a career spanning documentary made about Pearl Jam, you know? Right. Right. For sure. I, um, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, it's not fair because obviously Kurt's not here. So everybody gets held up against this impossible standard um, of, you know, this person that died in 1994 um, you know, you can imagine what Kurt's arc might have been, in, you know, if he hadn't had a shotgun in his house. Um, and the way, the way I think about that is like Steve Albini, um, meaning, you know, maybe Kurt would be like doing what Steve's doing now, which is kind of shit posting on Twitter, but also spending a lot of time sort of apologizing <laughs> for things he you know, right. have said and done in the past uh, before he was as enlightened as he is now. And I like Steve Albini um, and obviously him and Kurt work together. So, you know, that that's sort of maybe an apt example, but um you know yeah i mean look i love kurt cobain i'm not like i'm not trashing him i I guess i'm just saying um i find that dynamic interesting between them because i do think that eddie reacted differently to that than jeff and usually the eddie perspective certainly in the movie that's what's presented right and and like you were saying andrew the film doesn't really go into like the punk rock or indie rock past the Pearl Jam. It's sort of yeah. like, and like Mother Love Bone, and I like Mother Love Bone, but like, you know, they're like this glammy hard rock band, you know, yeah. like there's not nothing really punk about um, Mother Love Bone. Um, so it presents those guys a little bit differently, maybe if you don't have the context of what they were doing earlier in the 80s. Yeah, I think, does do the words sub pop appear in this film? I don't think so. No, no, that's a good question. We can yeah. we can check that, but I'm pretty sure. Um, ha- Steve, have you seen the movie Hype? Yes. 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 We did an episode about that um, about a year ago, and you know it's interesting. I, I in that movie, I was sort of waiting for the 
uh, Pearl Jam sucks discussion from all of those like uh, Seattle hipsters. And it doesn't come. And in fact, like Eddie gets a pretty lengthy interview space in that movie. And so it's like. It's in the I'm subtext, though, of that movie, yeah. starting yeah. with the title, you <laughs> right. know, right. Like, sure. like, where does the hype come from? You know, right. it comes from these really big bands. And the thing with that movie is that it's making an argument that, like, there's all these other great bands yeah. that didn't get attention because they're overshadowed by these big bands that created the the hype or whatever. And you watch the movie and you're like, for the most part, that's not true. Yeah. You know, that a lot of these bands, they might be fine. They might be nice people, but like they're local bands. There's a couple like Love Battery, I think is a, is a really good band. They never really blew up, but I like that band. But, you know, a lot of those bands, you're like, this is, they're kind of mediocre. And and like the film doesn't really acknowledge that. And I always felt like that's kind of a weakness of this movie that like, oh, you're saying Gas Huffer should have been as big as Pearl Jam? Like, I don't I, I think we understand why that didn't happen. Like, no, <laughs> sh- no offense to them. But, you know, what you have in that movie is what you have in a lot of local music scenes. I, I, I've covered local music scenes before. Yeah. And you always have this dynamic of the bands that go off and they tour everywhere. And then you have the bands that kind of stick around town and the bands that stick around town, they win all of the polls. You know, they, they're the ones who like get called the, the best band. They're the ones who sometimes get, who get written about more, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. because the music writers in town are friends with the local bands. Yeah. And they have access. Whereas the, yeah. Whereas the band that's like actually big, and tours everywhere is almost ignored locally. You know, yeah. that happens. Like, I, I don't know if that still happens. That that happened, you know, in my experience and just seeing it elsewhere, just, um, yeah. So how like tribal wave, the, like waves see, here in San Diego. No one, no one's, no one's writing, writing odes to waves in the, yeah. the San Diego music scene. But there's probably some like pop reggae band that always gets written up. It's like, this is the best band in San Diego. This yes. like, pop reggae band yeah. you know that no one's ever heard of it will never go anywhere right. you know that's the best band in san diego yeah, yeah. that's how that always works with those mm-hmm. types of things mm-hmm. so i think the hype has a little bit of that yeah uh, um, but i do like i do like that movie i like the eddie better stuff eddie better is making that case in the film by the way he there's a scene in that movie where he's like it shouldn't have just been us it should have been yeah, this yeah, band yeah. and this band and this band and it's like eddie well, I don't. They're, they're, they don't have you though, Eddie. You know, yeah, they exactly. don't have That's a rock thing. star. Yeah, you know. Like, have you heard your, your voice, Eddie? It's it's good. <laughs> yeah. It's quite. It's yeah. quite good. <laughs> it's like, look, you. They don't have this great looking guy with a huge voice. Yeah. You know, these guys they look like truck drivers. You know, yeah. and more power to them. But from an impartial point of view, it's clear why you made it and they didn't. You know, it, it's just the way it, it goes. So speaking of that, in the movie, you know, we, we, we're in this, the, the early Seattle scene. It's, you know, Andy Wood's still alive. There's some of that backstage uh, footage of, of Stone and Jeff. And, like, from right there, Chris Cornell absolutely, like, jumps off the screen. Like, you, right. can, you can not only see that he, like, uh, like separates himself from everybody else in, the, in his circle – but you, there's also clips that show that everybody else recognizes that too. You know, like the, right. the, the, the clip of, I think it's stone pointing. He's like, it's Chris Cornell. Mm-hmm. Um, right. It's like, it's like awesome stuff. That, that's like some of my favorite parts of this. And well, he's so movie. soulful. And, and he's the, the only, like, he's the only talking head in the movie other than the members of the band, which is so unusual for, is that a, true? for a rock doc. Yeah. Oh, it, well, yeah. The person I was waiting for oh. is Dave Grohl, who's a talking head in every rock doc, but does not appear in this one. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, I mean, Cornell, just like when he's talking about Andrew Wood and like how I mean, you know, he, he starts breaking down, like when yeah. talking about how he died. I mean, yeah, that's that's really powerful, man. Like, yeah, he's uh, and he's so sensitive. You know, I don't know if I had seen at that point many interviews with Chris Cornell. Yeah, I think I saw some after that, but yeah. I don't know. He, he was not what I I remember watching that movie and being like, this is not what I expected Chris Cornell yeah. to and, be like. You know, and that's part of the stuff where like just the the camera crow skill as a filmmaker comes together so well. You've got yes, you've got electric talking head segments from Chris Cornell telling stories about like 
you know, talking to Joey Ramone about the difference between the New York scene and the, and the Seattle scene. But then you lay that on top of like, um, you know, Cornell, uh, you know, original footage of hunger strike or these early concerts with Cornell and Eddie, uh, wrestling each other on stage. And like, I mean, it's, it's, it's just like sprinting through a cornfield. It's like, it's fun to watch the movie at this part right here, you know? Yeah. And again, just, you know, the access to yeah. footage and then, you know, and again, he was, I think sh- shooting stuff in 1990, you know, interviewing those guys because just cause he was in town and he knew them, which is not something anyone else could have. It's done. yeah. It's I mean, like it, Jesus it, where you just happen to have somebody with a camera at the very yeah. earliest possible stage. Um, but I do think the access thing almost undermines what Cameron Crowe is doing in this movie because, um, you know, we watch a lot of documentaries, obviously. Um, and this documentary has tons and tons and tons of found footage, stock footage, you know, things of early Seattle, other bands. It's a real collage. And the skill to weave that together and have it seem like a piece I think is sort of underrated, meaning a lot of documentaries will have, you know, uh, these kind of montages of old videos of different bands or stock footage of the place where the artist grew up or whatever it may be. And it's okay, but it's sort of clunky. And then you see a movie like this where it really is so all well integrated. I don't know, you know, for whatever reason, it's kind of like some people can put a collage together and it looks like a piece of art. And some people, it looks like just some stuff that's on a page. Um, so you can't really put your finger on it, but he does such a good job with that as well as the interview footage is beautifully beautiful. Like it's, uh, you know, the, the Cornell, the, the Cornell looks incredible. Interview foot, the Cornell interview footage. He, he, it's like, he, he's glowing. He looks as beautiful as a human being could look in, yeah. that, in that, in that shot. Yeah. Well, yeah. And like how, and again, I mean, I think, you know, they knew Cameron Crowe for a long time. So how many filmmakers are going to get Eddie better on a beach? with like yeah. a fire or he's playing guitar you know like that that's not going to be most directors are going to you know, especially someone like eddie vetter he's not going to feel comfortable um doing that you know you're talking about the collage aspect of the film and i think at times it reminds me of jeff stein's the kids are all right which is one mm-hmm. of my favorite rock documentaries ever and it's a I think an apt comparison because it's the film about the who. And I think there's a lot of connections between the who and Pearl jam, but that's one of the things I love about the kids are all right, is that there are no talking heads at all. It is, it is just found footage. Mm -hmm. He shot some performances of like the modern day who at that time, that book in the film. But other than that, it's all found footage and it's, it's really great. Uh, And in a way I'd almost like, a version of this movie that was just like that because a great thing about the kids are all right is that you see the who on the rock and roll circus and you see them at woodstock and you see these other performances and it really drives it it shows you why the who is great it doesn't tell you you know there's no one telling you this is a great band You, you you watch that movie and you can see like what a fucking amazing band so that's one of the great things I think about that movie. Have you guys talked about that? Yet? We haven't. We uh, it's on our our uh, list. We we sort of have a an odd system of of deciding what to what to talk about. Where, that that's involves a great holding film. some off. That you know, uh, we have not like for instance, both of us are obsessed with history of the Eagles, but we we can't bring ourselves to talk about it yet. Oh well, man, we'll... <laughs> you're gonna need like a long episode, like six for that. six or eight hours, I think. Yeah. Uh, um. So like. The mama sons, the mama son story here, as as told here, as told in your book, it, it's, I mean, it's the stuff of like rock and roll history. It's it's, uh, uh it doesn't need uh, an especially talented author, I think, to like make it good, um, but like this movie, uh, as does your book, really brings it to life and makes it incredible. I mean, you know, it, the source material is really strong. But they do a great job here of of weaving together all these different things that we're talking about and make it a very memorable rock doc moment, I think. Yeah, he has the actual tape, which is pretty uh, yeah. amazing. And mm-hmm. yeah, the 619 number here in San Diego, you know. Right. Um, I, I was looking at where exactly the Bacchanal was. Dave, did you ever see a show at the Bacchanal? 
No, I don't really remember exactly where that was. I, I definitely never went there. It it's, may have shut down before I was, you know, old enough to really be going to shows. I could tell you about it's over by like cool Society Brewing. It's over by Society okay. Brewing in, in, okay, yeah. in Kearney Mesa. I don't remember. Yeah. Maybe I went, but I don't. Yeah, I don't remember. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. So the um, uh, uh, the movie is a great compliment to the book and vice versa. I mean, watching this movie this week while I was reading this book, it was just like it couldn't have been more perfect. Um, yeah. I love I love them both. Um, the the uh, just like I mean, you Steve, you articulated a complaint that Andy and I have about every music documentary, which is we wish it was longer. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, there is a ton of great live footage, especially from the early days, and it is so visceral. And the stuff that, like, the thing that sticks with me from the movie, if I have one thing that it that you can't, um, you know, that I can't shake, is the footage of Eddie climbing the rafters. Um, oh, over and over at these shows, which you heard about at the time, um, and like hanging uh, off, you know, 20 feet, 30, it seems like impossibly high off the audience and then diving into the audience and like practically trying to kill himself every show. You talk about it in the book, right. but watching it happen is, no matter how many times I've seen this movie, um, I'm like, as a dad, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, yeah. I'm just like, please, dude, come down. Like, it's okay. It's a great show. You don't need to be doing this. Um, why, why do you think he was, was driven to do that? And what do you think kind of got him to <laughs> confine himself to, you know, a, a, a stage where he's not going to kill himself? Well, a lot of times he did that during the song Porch which uh, was always, especially in the early days, it was like the emotional climax of the Pearl Jam concert. And, you know, there would be this, if you know the song, you know there's like an instrumental part in the middle. And when they played the song live, it would get extended. And that's when Eddie started climbing everything and hanging above the stage. And and he's talked about this, that the the message of, of Porch, it's this sort of do or die type song like putting yourself on the line going out and trying to make your life happen even if it kills you and i think him climbing the rafters and putting his life in danger was a way to manifest itself i think it also says something about just where rock music was at that moment in time that you know the idea of someone coming into the audience and breaking the you know the fourth wall you know between yeah. you and the band i think it was for a band of that stature it, it, i think it felt revolutionary and felt exhilarating to people you know it became a cliche at some point to dive in the crowd and your you know, stage uh diving and all that kind of stuff and you know maybe it wasn't as fresh by the end of the decade but i think early on it was really exciting for people to feel like this guy isn't just on stage. He's hanging above us and he might actually hurt himself. Like this might act, you know, this isn't just like a canned rock yeah. show. You yeah. know, there's, there's something spontaneous and real happening here. And you know, you know that's that spontaneous and real element. It, it survives even past the, the stage diving and climbing stuff in a Pearl Jam show. Now. Um, I mean, I, I always have my, you mentioned this book, always have your, your guard up for the, the things that are made to look spontaneous, but are part of a show that happens every night. Right. And, right. Uh, you know, I, I think t- because of the type of band Pearl Jam is and because I listen to some of their bootlegs, I, I'm I'm pretty comfortable saying that some of the things I've seen him do during shows are are, in fact, <laughs> spontaneous. But it's yeah. like it's it's a it's an it's an elder man's version of what he was doing then. Now it's the stage patter, the talking, the storytelling, the um, Springsteen esque. Uh, every show is different quality of him talking to the crowd. Um, I saw a show here in San Diego that his mom was at and he took his uh, famous bottle of wine and pushed it out into the crowd and they right, right, passed right. it all the way back to her. She took a sip and then passed it all the way back through the crowd to him. Um, and so like, you know, like the the showman of Eddie Vedder it is is still around, even if he's not risking his life at 60 years old. At yeah, you know, I, I, I was doing another interview for this book and someone brought that up and they were like, you know it was a lot more exciting. Like when Eddie would do that kind of stuff, you know, why did, what is, why doesn't he do that now? And I'm like, well, for, for one thing, you're older, it's just harder to do. But I also think, you know, if you're a guy in your fifties doing that, I think it looks a little uh, silly, you know, yeah. unless yeah. you're Mick Jagger, you know, or you're Iggy pop or something. I, I, I just don't think it's different. If, if you look like you're trying to act like you're a young man yeah. versus actually being a young man. Um, just to, 
piggyback on something you just said about like the stage pattern and all these stories that he tells and it's always interesting and funny when you talk to like a Grateful Dead fan or a Fish yeah. fan or whatever about like why do you listen to all these Pearl Jam shows like they're not really improvising like what's so different and I'm like well it's the atmosphere that's different and yeah. you listen to these shows you could hear the atmosphere is different every yeah. time even if the songs sound alike although they're not alike if you listen to it enough they sound different you know yeah. but you you're really kind of plugging into something that is like kind of like around the music in a way mm-hmm. um but yeah it's always funny ex- trying to explain that to like a deadhead because <laughs> it, it doesn't doesn't always compute right you know right. The, the appeal of that I saw I saw Eddie did this earlier this year. He did a uh, a a pretty good Bill Walton impression uh, because Bill Walton was in the crowd. <laughs> oh <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So that was that was that was funny too. In terms um, of Eddie's kind of growing maturity and the kind of evolution of the band, one of the anecdotes that popped out at me from your book was that, uh, and it's very brief. But you mentioned that at some point in the mid '90s, Henry Rollins took Eddie aside after a show and told him to like relax and enjoy his fame more. And it's really hard to imagine like mid nineties, Henry Rollins telling somebody to chill out. <laughs> like it seems like right, so right. antithetical. Do you have anything more about that? I just love that little bit and how it illustrates how all these elder statesmen, <laughs> uh, Henry Rollins probably is really that much older than Eddie, but he'd been around. Um, but how all these older statesmen from Neil Young to Eddie, you know, to, to Henry Rollins and all these other people were kind of like stepping in there to, um, to try to help him navigate this journey. Yeah, and you have like Ian Mackay from Fugazi. Sure. Uh, I believe he was at the show that Pearl Jam played uh, right after Kurt Cobain died, like the first so show bro- that they played. So was my brother, and I was supposed to attend with him, but my oh, uh, man. my mom at the last minute decided that that was not a great place for an 11-year-old. <laughs> oh, man, that would have been amazing. Yeah. You know, there is something about Eddie Vedder, and like I, you know, I don't want to make him sound cynical or anything, but I do think that there is a political aspect with him where he reached out to these underground heroes Mm -hmm. and became friends with them. And I almost wonder if it was like a way to disarm potential criticism. Fugazi likes him. Who cares that Kurt Cobain? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, and not to say it wasn't genuine. I think it was, but I think it was a canny move or like to go on a tour with Mike Watt, you know, where you like that tour where like he was, uh, on guitar and Dave Grohl was on drums, you know, like just, it was like all of the alt rock superstars hit out. It was like the alt rock superstar relocation program in 1995, like go, go tour with uh, Mike Watt. Um, You know, and, and it speaks to the time that that was something that, that people felt like they would have to do, you know, really Henry Rollins saying that it feels like almost progressive in a way. I feel like that's something that, people would say now like anyone would say that now but like in the mid 90s to like tell a rock star just enjoy being a rock star like yeah you have a great life right that was not not necessarily something you'd expect someone like him to say you know but i think it's good advice (laughs) well and it's and it's like and it's part of like what you get to in the end of the book about like what you know they're less prolific now but they still do write songs and some of them are still like do very well as singles and, you know, I, I mean, I think you could you could do worse than explaining like Just Breathe as Eddie's and, and other songs like it as like Eddie's finally listening to Henry Rollins and enjoying his life as a rock star type right. era, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I write about this in the book, like when my sister got married, she yeah. got married to Just Breathe. And my sister was born, uh, you know, in 1990. You know, she, I don't think she could name another Pearl Jam song but she liked that song it wasn't because it was a Pearl Jam song it was because it's a pretty song that works well for a wedding I mean it it could have been by anybody right um and you can listen to a song like that and say well this isn't as hard as the 90s stuff which it's not uh but also at the same time it's kind of an achievement to write a song like that that crosses over to people that would have no idea who you are otherwise, but like Mm -hmm. it has its own life, you know, as something else. Um, And it's just, yeah. I mean, that song really is like, that's like one of their most popular songs. on. I was blown away. You mentioned the songs that it has been streamed more than. Yeah. Which, you know, it's, it's dangerous to say that in the book because things always change, but yeah, it was extreme more than daughter, I believe. Mm -hmm. And like, it's crazy. Like a couple of like the big, 
90s yeah. ballads it, 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 it's more popular because of people like my sister you know yeah. who uh just think that's a pretty song there's probably lots of people getting married to that song well days. i gotta find out if anybody who doesn't like fish has ever been married to waste because that <laughs> no, no, that that is what i'm i'm looking for if anybody out there if if you know somebody who's been married to waste and doesn't like fish i need to t- i need to interview that person on this show yeah the- um i want to Sorry, God. Okay. I just want to say, Sorry. kind of t- putting a point on this, like uh, the 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 book and to some extent the movie um, is a lot about aging gracefully, which is a you know a, a kind of an interesting topic. I mean, there's part of me maybe when the you know that would have thought that you know Eddie in 1995 singing "This Is Not for You, Fuck You" might be saying that about Eddie in 2022, but I don't think so. Like I think he, you know that he and they managed to. Um, to weather the storms and your book, uh, you know, we're not going to spoil everything. Um, and this can't replace reading the book, which you, people listening to this should do because it is great. But um, your book really does um, make a really compelling case, both giving the, you know, ever, all the fans, the red meat of, of the, you know, nineties explosion, how exciting and fun that was, but also um, how they managed to, um, you know, kind of all grow up um, along with, you and me and people of our generation and 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 um right you know maybe make some compromises along the way but but sort of stay true to that kind of uh you know who they wanted to be yeah and and just to you know go back to your point about like would would 1995 eddie vetter be resentful of 2022 eddie vetter and i don't think so at all because eddie vetter to me always wanted to be like a rock star in his 50s I think there was a part of him that wanted to be that when he was in his twenties, yeah. and you can see that by who, how, like who that's he the chose Neil to Young hang thing, out with. Right? That's yeah, that's Neil, the Young, Neil Young, thing, yeah. Pete Townsend, you know, yeah. he just gravitating. Petty, you know, Joe yeah. Strummer. Like yeah. he always, he was never like, oh fuck the old people. He was yeah. like, I, re- I revere the old people. Like I want right. to learn from them. Like they're who I aspire to be. And I, I, I feel like if you see any better now. And he's like happy all the time. Like yeah. he is the happiest dude. He seems yeah. like he just loves his life and because he's got a great life and, you know, all that, the, the sort of angsty Eddie Vedder, like that hasn't existed for like years. Now. Yeah. And I really think that a lot of that has to do with him kind of aging into who he always wanted to be. Like now, like like in the 90s, maybe he was worried that, like I don't have the track record or the background to earn all this praise I'm getting. But now, you know, there's no question, you know, like he has <laughs> the kind of career that all of his heroes had. Like he's got like decades of, of wear in the tires, you know, he is as grizzled now as like his heroes were. So right. yeah, I think if anything, he would have like looked at his 2022 self and be like, Oh, I'm, I'm glad. I became that. Yeah. And he, but he can still, they can still in 2022, based on what I've heard, you know, in terms of the, you know, recent tour stuff that I've heard, they can still channel that and perform those old songs in a way that's credible. Unlike a lot of aging rock stars where it's like, come on, man. Like, you know, you're not like, I love the who last time I saw them a few years back, they were great. But saying, I hope I die before I get old. It's just, you know, it can't not be, uh, you know, you can't, you, you can't not notice that disconnect. Right. Yeah, I mean, I I will say again. I think when you see Pearl Jam now, you're right. They can play songs from ten and they sound great. But I do think that there is a different feel to them. Where if you listen to like a bootleg from '92, there is a sense sometimes of like, oh, is this band gonna self destruct? You know, is yeah. this band gonna fall apart? Whereas now, if Eddie Vedder sings alive, you don't feel like it's a guy tortured over the idea that he's alive you feel like it's someone who is expressing joy that i've survived it's a different kind of feeling and i think it's also different for the audience because the audience is older too for the most part Mm -hmm. and what they're looking for from pearl jam is different now i think when people saw them in the 90s they were looking at them as sort of like an expression of their own turmoil like i was saying like i listened to them and i was like okay i I get the self-hatred here. Like I relate to the self-hatred in this music. Whereas now you go see them and it's like, 
it's like a ritual almost. It's yeah. like a, it's a confirmation of like, this is part of our shared history. And isn't it great that we as a community can come together in this place and still feel moved by it. You know, it, it's just a different kind of thing. And I think they're equally valid and equally powerful. Yeah. So uh, we're, we're, we're running out of time. I want, there's a couple things I want to get to. Um, one person who does not appear in this movie Maybe there's a reference to him that I missed, but Brendan O'Brien uh, is not in this movie. He plays a, a major role in your book, almost like as like another member of the band, uh, you know, at certain points. And I, I I mentioned that because I think there it's it's indicative of something else that's not in this movie, which is like obviously they talk about Ticketmaster, and certainly they talk about Eddie's fighting with the music industry but there's not actually any attention paid to um the business of pearl jam in that early stage of their career uh you, they don't mention getting a record contract how that happened who they got it with what it, how it influenced them um how the promotion was was helping spin them up in that early phase where they're like you know, breaking really quickly and, and blowing up and becoming, you know, getting on Lollapalooza. Like that's all treated as, as just like this organic happening. And, um, I think like, you know, I, I com- if you compare it to something like running down a dream, like how much time is spent in the studio with Petty and Jimmy Iovine and like the particulars of the songwriting process and the production process and how much time was spent you know, on his record contract and him fighting with the studio and, how you know how promotion of a band works and and so like Cameron Crowe just makes a decision to sort of just like that's not the story he wants to tell and he doesn't have any part of that so big picture about that decision about the the, by the movie and also the omission of Brendan O'Brien as like a significant figure in Pearl Jam history yeah I mean again I think if you had a longer film you could have spent time more time on yeah like how records were made yeah uh which I don't think you would have to do that for every album, but I would have liked to have seen more stuff about like the making of Vitology. Yeah. And, uh, you know, which seems like that was a very chaotic moment in the band. And again, that's a great thing about the book is that it goes more into that kind of stuff. Um, but you know, like, I don't know, do you guys talk about, do you talk about the classic albums documentaries on your show? Yes. Yeah. We, we did serious? the, uh, the Brown album, fantastic episode on the, on the bands, the Brown album. Uh, you got to talk about Asia at some point. That's okay. like one of the all time classics, yeah. uh, the Steely Dan one. But yeah, that, one of the great things about like those documentaries, like from a filmmaking standpoint, are like pretty basic, yeah. but they're fascinating if you care about the record to see it get broken down and talking about how songs were written and how records were made. I mean, one thing about my book that I'll say is that I think I go pretty in depth into talking about the songs themselves. And yeah. and analyzing the songs and analyzing like the lyrics and which, you know, I think with Pearl Jam, as big as they are, I don't feel like that's ever been something that people have really looked at, you know. No, and there's, there's a, like a passing mention here. They're like, oh, Eddie thought that the mix on 10 was too commercial. And right. It's like, oh, OK, well, you talked about 10 eight minutes ago and no one mentioned that. So, like, what are you talking like? You know, do you want to say more? Yeah. About that, you know, well, like one, like one of the cool again like one of the many kind of great examples of footage in that film is that they show eddie and stone playing an early version of daughter on the tour bus yeah 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 yeah, yeah, presumably like when they were writing the song and that's like really cool i mean again if you had a longer film it would have been cool to be like to have stone gossard sit down and be like this is how I wrote all these riffs that ended yeah. up on like all the classic early riffs that ended up on that demo tape uh, that was sent to uh, Eddie Vedder. Like I, I would have, I could have used a couple minutes of stone just walking through that, like maybe go to the room where he was laying it down, talk yeah. about like, you know, where did those songs come from? You know, like, yeah, there's not a lot of talk about process. No, in that in that film, and, and there's not in a lot of documentaries like this. Um, yeah, Running Down a Dream might be like the exception. I, I, I'm gonna guess Get Back. <laughs> you know, well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> sure. Well, I mean, we just I talked mean, about we just we just last week did an episode about the other one, the Bob Weir documentary, where um, they do talk a, 
it's not necessarily about process of recording. They don't talk about any of that, but they do get more into the details of the music and like what makes him interesting as a rhythm guitar player. Uh, you know, this, right. this movie doesn't really get into any of that kind of technical stuff. No, but that's no. I mean, and the book does. Yeah, um, there's this the like does, middle yeah, section. Breaking. There's this like middle section of this movie that's like, it's like the business section to some extent, and like the hype section and the backlash section, and Kurt Cobain dies section, and Eddie has a stalker section, and it like conflates all of these things that are happening over like a five-year period like eddie's talking about like all of a sudden we skip forward over vitology and he's talking about no code and how that was made to like create some distance between himself and the audience it's like there's like this 15 minutes of the movie that's like just this hodgepodge of all the different stuff that cameron crow wanted to put in but he didn't want to keep going back and forth to it and so like you're in 1992 you're in 1997 you're back in 1993 and it's like like you know that like the the part that really gives it away is that celebrity death match is featured mm-hmm. which doesn't come out until like that movie that show doesn't exist until pearl jam ceases to be a cultural phenomenon in a lot of ways you know and it happens in the cultural phenomenon section of the movie yeah i mean look i think you could have done an edit of this movie where you have part one early years to uh say yield yeah, I mean, I guess I'm dividing it the way I divide up. My you do that's your <laughs> right. so <laughs> or the history, so, of the yeah, in a way. Yeah, but like to yield, and then, and then you, the second part is the 2000s up to 2011, yeah. and you could you could structure it as like Pearl Jam started out the decade down, and then they they rose up and they got they found their mojo again, yeah. you know, and I think, and that's like a four hour edit of the film, yeah. and I think you could have done that. Yeah. Even in 2011, you know, a lot of things you're talking about, I think it's because the film's two hours right? and uh, there's a lot of material to cover and that's not a lot of time, really. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think the criticism of this film is that it's not long enough. <laughs> right? you- maybe that's because we're fans and we want more of it. But th- the thing is, is that there's obviously so much great footage, so much great footage, you know, like. Yeah. I love the uh, interviews of uh, with Eddie from like the yield period, like where his hair looks amazing. It's like, <laughs> kind of short and curly. Real short, yeah. And and there's a couple interview clips where he's like, he seems really angry. Yes. You yes. know, he seems really pissed off. And I'm like, I would have loved a little more of that. Uh-huh. I want to see a little more of that. I want to see a little bit more of, you know, them playing Hunger Strike at the Rip magazine party, you know? <laughs> You know, all these things you could extend by 30 seconds or something. And I don't know. I just, it feels a little cramped, you know, yeah. like you're saying. And and I would have loved to see more breakdowns of the music. You know, I, I not every song, but I think it would be cool for some, you know, take like one of the songs from 10, a song from Versus, you know. How did you know, Eddie writing Better Man? I think the right. story of Better Man, I, I write about it in the book. I think that's like an interesting, this old song that he had forever and he didn't really want to put it on a record. And then it ends up being this huge. He, thanks to, thanks Brendan to O'Brien the tricks encouragement of Brendan yeah. O'Brien. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Which, and it's so funny because, you know, the idea that, because, you know, Eddie Vedder's idea was, well, I'll have the first part of the song be quiet. Yeah. Because that will make it less commercial. And it's like you made it more commercial by doing <laughs> right. it, it that way because yeah. because yeah, exactly because it just builds so right. well because because like when you you listen to the versions of that song that he played with his band Bad Radio, the drums come in right away and it's kind of a boring song. Yeah, you know the fact that the drums come in late. It's just the simple rule of dynamics. It just it it gives a sense of drama and uplift to this song it just it makes the song yeah. but i just think it's hilarious that eddie was like well yeah let's kind of we'll, we'll do this kind of more muted beginning so it won't be as anthemic yeah it's more anthemic <laughs> for that yeah. reason yeah i think I, in, saw, I, I think in the rock doc cinematic universe uh this movie comes a little bit earlier right at the beginning of kind of peak rock doc era um and maybe if they'd made it now um you know they would have 
gone a little longer because we've got these long music documentaries now that are popular. Um, you know, we've got your get backs and your Yeezuses and so forth. Um, and maybe it just would have, you know, the, 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 the kind of, he would have been a little bit freer with the structure, um, to kind of get into some of those tangents. Um, yeah. do you, do you have a minute to get one, to get in one more thing before we wrap? Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, well, Andy, you go, then I got another one. All right. Well, so I want to say uh, another part here that I, 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 I really like about this movie. Uh, every time I, I watch it, it sort of uh, is affecting to me is the uh, Jeff section um, and culminating with Jeff and Eddie both sort of solemnly recognizing how much they were looking for somebody like the other person in their lives right. up, up until the moment that they did. Uh, and, and Eddie, you know, Hey, maybe Eddie is like a world class con man, and and he's not as uh, as emotional as he seems to be. But like, it really seems like he he's talking about it and gets choked up just thinking about like how lucky he was to find Jeff Emmett's friendship and musical relationship at that time in his life. Um, yeah, and and like that whole part with thumb in my way playing, and you're back in Montana with Jeff. Like, I I think that's a, a really beautiful section of this movie. Yeah, you know, you were mentioning how this kind of came at the beginning of like the rock doc boom. Yeah. And when you said that, it made me think of the Rush documentary, Beyond the Lighted mm. Stage. And like how the great thing about that movie is that you feel like these guys are actually friends. Yeah. You know, yeah. which you don't get that. You definitely don't get that from uh, History of the Eagles. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's so heartwarming. Like, oh, all these guys, you know, like, especially like Getty Lee and uh, Alex Lifeson, you know, just being friends from the time that they were kids. And you're right. I mean, that is a great part of the of Pearl Jam 20, just seeing like the human side of it and being like, okay, these guys actually do seem like they're, they're, they're friends. And, um, I, and I love, I mean, I love the early footage of Jeff too, you know, oh, yeah. I, I mean, in my That's book, cool. I write about my, my love of Jeff Amitz hats, <laughs> love his yes, hats exactly. from the nineties. He was master of the Tam, uh, yeah. back then. And like, just him like shooting hoops. Yeah. Like in and 19, just him and him and stone really owned the, the bandana with the hat. Look, Oh yeah. Both, both of them. Absolutely. I mean, Axel Rose, I was, let's not, I was like, let's not slam there... Axel. He did that too. Fair. Fair. <laughs> but true. I was watching it and I was like, is that is there room for me to bring the bandana and a hat thing back? I ultimately decided oh, that there, there isn't. But but, you know, it, it's it's a thought. We're, when I Andy, love we're, we're going to see Wilco this weekend. I want I want you to be rocking the bandana with a hat. <laughs> bandana with a hat. Yeah. I'm also a big fan of McCready, you know, with the blouses, like the Stevie yeah. Ray Vaughan look. Yeah. I love that era of McCready when he was yes. just like going total SRV. Laying it all out there. I, and I love um, it. I mean, I. And I just love McCready oh, in general. He, he, I mean, that's like such a big part of the, as you talk about in the book, that that's like a, how a, a Pearl Jam show differentiates, it differentiates itself night to night is, is McCready solo in a lot of ways. So, well, and just him talking about like in the film, uh, blacking out during the SNL performance. Oh my God, and yeah. then they show, they show him playing and he looks so fucked up. <laughs> yes. And, uh, you know, it's the, just a crazy thing. Uh, okay, so Steve, in the book, um, like you said, you get a little bit more into the text and analyzing Eddie as a, you know, as a, as a lyricist. Um, one thing you do emphasize a lot is Eddie's um, ability to empathize with people other than him, whether it's women or other groups. Um, and, you know, I think that was sort of, um, you know, I don't know if it's unique, but un unusual. Uh, at the time that he was writing his, you know, 90s hits to kind of take those perspectives. I, you know, I love that. In 2022, I feel like that's almost a controversial topic because there is a lot more emphasis on people from different groups, marginalized communities telling their own stories. Um, and, you know, I'm just wondering if you have any thought about that. Um, you know, we're not trying to be the woke police or something like that, but yeah. Some he he's getting in the time even at the time I remember him being complimented for that in a way that now I feel like um might be you know seen as a little bit problematic. Yeah, I mean, again, I think it was a different time, and I, I feel like I feel like even now I don't I. I don't think that people are going to go back and give Eddie, uh, give Eddie better a hard time for that. Yeah. Cause I think that there is something to be said for 
your intentions and also the way in which you are communicating that perspective. I think that in in his songs, you know, I I always feel like it was writing at it, writing those songs from the perspective of humanizing whoever he was writing about. It wasn't done like in, a, in like sort of like an exploitive way. I don't think it was even done in like a sort of patting myself on the back kind of way. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's an interesting thing. I, I, I hadn't really thought about that, but I don't know. It's like, like if you listen to a song like better man, for instance, like he's writing from the perspective of this woman being in a, in a terrible relationship, I guess like, I don't know what the argument is against writing a song like that, unless you're saying that the only person who can write a song like that is someone who's also in a, who's also a woman in, in a bad relationship. Yeah. You know, you know I saw it, it's hard. It's I like, saw, it, it, it's like, you know, like Tom Petty writing American girl. Sure. Right. Should that just be written by an American girl? Like, I don't know. It's, yeah. it, it's a tricky thing. Uh, you know, it, it's also, I think about who has access to an audience, you know, if, if it's only white guys writing songs about women and there's no women writing songs about women, you know, that's one issue. But if a man is writing about a woman and there's also women who can write about women, you know what I mean? I think that changes it a little bit. I think it becomes, I think it becomes a problem when there aren't people who are telling their own stories in addition to someone else who's trying, who's trying to tell a story. Like if it was just Eddie Vedder writing songs about yeah. women and there were yeah. no women writing songs about women, I think that would be a different or story. Or being able but to get their music out there. Right. But even well, in and, the 90s, I don't think that was necessarily no, true. But no, even then. Uh, but, it, but it's certainly now, it's like even more, I think, diverse than it was then. And, yeah, and, you know, Eddie throws the Ohana Festival every year. And, you know, take a look at that festival any year. He fills that lineup with women. I mean, you know, he, go, he goes out of his way. And in fact, I saw, to tie things together, um, I saw Liz Fair perform Better Man with him at the Ohana mm. Festival. And it's interesting, actually, you know, I, to sound like Jimmy Iovine, you know, uh, a song written by a man, sung by a woman, does, you know, <laughs> sounds, it, it really changes the song, actually. Even though right. Eddie is writing from the perspective of a woman, just hearing Liz Fair sing it did change the the context of that song quite a bit. It, it was interesting. Right. And it, and I, I will say, too, that for a band like Pearl Jam, the biggest rock band in the world, this arena rock band, in some ways a very masculine band, mm -hmm. to write songs like that, I think it is worthwhile because it's introducing those concepts into a context where it would not normally exist. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I hate to talk about it. This kind of thing strictly in the terms of like, educating i'm putting educating in quotes like you know dumb teenage males <laughs> you know because i think these songs have value beyond that but i do think that there were a lot of dumb teenage males who heard songs like that and we're like wow women have feelings too and <laughs> yeah. that's such a dumb thing to say but i do think that there was some kind of awakening for because again like a lot of, you know teenage males are dumb they don't necessarily understand that kind of thing and maybe listening to songs like that uh broaden their perspective a little bit more you know and turn them into better men so to speak <laughs> yeah i loved at that time that the, the beastie boys you mentioned uh you know as well as you know certainly nirvana and others you know popular bands at the time were trying to educate the you know the daves and the steves and the andys of the world um about yeah. you know other perspectives and considering um the needs of other people F you know at least they were from a position of privilege trying to leverage that to 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 reach down and to help um people that might not be getting all the opportunities they were getting uh, that's how i saw it at the yeah, time so yeah like kurt cobain writing liner notes and incesticide saying like if you don't like gay people like get the fuck out of our audience you know like, <laughs> that's a pretty amazing thing you know um in the early you know because i'm sure you know i know in my friend group we used homophobic slurs all the time it was just the way you talked at mm -hmm. that time it was such an ignorant period and uh so to have a band like that be like fuck you like don't do that it was like okay you know what i mean like that was a that that changed like a lot of people like how they acted for you know without question 
Yeah, I kind of feel like I love it when artists are, are, you know, trying to broaden people's perspectives. And then when they're saying things that are kind of dumb and ignorant, maybe I forgive them and just say, well, that's, you know, you got to separate the art from the artist. It's a complicated issue. You know? <laughs> right, right. Exactly. <laughs> you kind of can't have it both ways, but we sort of somehow do. So, um, yeah. All right. So, Andy, you got anything else before we get to our uh, our final question here? I think I think it's time for the final question. OK, so, Steve, we always ask at the end. um, we we're unreservedly we unreservedly plugging your book Long Road Pearl Jam and the Soundtrack of a Generation. Everybody should get you know should buy that and uh, and support your in local fact, bookstore. In fact, this is that. a good time, Stephen. Where should they buy it? What what should they do if they would like to purchase this book? You know, I don't think I'm allowed to like endorse booksellers because the publishers always like, um, you don't want to alienate anyone or anyone anything. Okay. So I I would just you know I would say like wherever you books wherever you buy books. It's fine by me. Obviously, if you have a local bookstore that you love, support your local bookstore if you can do that. Uh, but I know a lot of people live in towns, unfortunately, like maybe there's not a local bookstore. So you got to buy it where you where you can buy it. So it it, it doesn't make a difference for me personally yeah. where they buy where it. you buy it. Uh, so but yeah, just but if you can buy it, I, I wherever you buy it or however you buy it, I'm very appreciative. <laughs> All right. So um, in terms of the movie uh Pearl Jam 20. Uh if somebody's not particularly a fan of Pearl Jam, maybe they haven't read your book, etc., but they're just looking for something to watch tonight. Uh would you recommend this movie? Yeah, I think so. I I, I think if you're just a presumably if you're listening to the show, you like rock music, you like <laughs> rock and roll documentaries. I think it's a well-made film. I think it's a film that will show you why this band made an impact even if you're like i don't care for the music um and i think i think it is well made for sure and there and there's interesting characters in the film i think all the band members i think their story is pretty interesting so and i'd say the same thing about my book you know i would say that um of course i would recommend my book <laughs> to anyone out there <laughs> yeah. but i would just say i think you know one of the things i tried to do in the book is put Pearl Jam in a larger context where I'm talking about the band, but I'm also talking about other stuff that was going on in the culture and how they connect to Pearl Jam. So my hope is that even if you are like an agnostic with Pearl Jam or you're not really interested, that there will be other things in the book that will draw you in uh, that will be interesting to you. I think that there's a lot of other stuff in there. Um, and maybe the book will make you a Pearl Jam fan by the end. You know, that'd be great. Andy, would you recommend this movie? Yeah. Yeah, two thumbs up. Cameron Crow, <laughs> absolutely rules. This movie's great. L- love it. Yeah, we love this movie. There's no debate. Uh, this, you know, the live footage had me jumping off the couch. Uh, and um, there's just tons and tons of great little rock docs moments in the book in the movie. Um, so yeah, we love it. Recommend it. Uh, the book, of course, uh, and um, all your books. <laughs> I mean, you write a lot of books, and they're good. Uh, I I love Twilight of the Gods. I'm reading the R- Radiohead book now. Um, just get into the Haydn verse. Is, is there a great, uh, yeah, uh, Haydn? Is there is there a great Black Crows documentary? And if not, why not? There's not, and because they, well, the Robinson brothers are not, like yeah. have their heads up their asses. Like they've yeah. been terrible stewards of their own history. Yeah. Um, I asked I said this. I asked I listeners said, because Steve wrote a, a book about the Black Crows that's also very good. Well, with my friend Steve Gorman, he, yeah. who's the drummer in the band, he—I mean, it's 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 his story. Yeah. Uh, but um, you know, I've I've talked about this with Steve. I'm like, there should be like archival live albums that they put out. Totally. Just yeah. just to remind people that they're at their peak. They were a great live band. Yeah. Uh, ninety two to ninety seven, just like one of the great live bands of their era. Uh, you know, there should be a box set commemorating that. You know, just because you got to remind people that you were good. That's why these box sets come out. I mean, it's for money too, <laughs> but also it reminds, there's always new people. There's always yeah. new audiences who don't know the past. And then a new box set comes out and that's how they get reminded. That happened to me when I was a kid, like there was a Led Zeppelin box set that came out in like 1990. There was like a Bob Dylan box set that came out biograph. There's, yeah, you know, and that's how I discovered that stuff. Biograph and, was my, was my significant introduction to like the, you know the the Bob Dylan universe outside of the five songs everyone yeah. knows when they are born, <laughs> and you need those gateways for for younger people, or you get left behind. And yeah. the Robinsons have just shown no interest in that at all. It, that would be a great movie, though. It would be, I would be so I mean, into that movie. Yeah, 
but uh, yeah, that's that is the, one of the most dysfunctional organizations <laughs> in rock history. All right, uh, without question. Rich and Chris, get it together. Get this movie going. Get uh, Steve to consult. Hire him. <laughs> and yeah, um, they would not ask me, man. <laughs> I could guarantee you that. They would not ask me. All right, maybe one day we'll have you back on to uh, talk about the future Black Rose documentary. But anything else you want to plug or shout out among your many many projects? No, nah, man, I'm just, I'm selling this book, man. I got to keep the eyes on the prize. So <laughs> yes, please check out the book, Long Road, Pearl Jam, and the Soundtrack of a Generation. I hope you all like it. All right. Uh, thanks uh, thanks to Steve. Thanks for listening to Rock Docs. We're at Rock Docs Pod on Twitter. You can check out our back episodes and comment and shout us out and yell at us and all those good things. Thanks for all the nice things people have been saying, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>